Hello, welcome to the Comic Book Commentary. I'm Bo Leidig, and this week we're going to be taking a look at another early image slash Wildstorm title. It's Wetworks number one, so let's zoom in and take a closer look. First published in June of 1994, before we'd like to, or before we get started today, I would like to point out that this book was actually supposed to launch in 93 alongside some other Wildstorm titles, notably Stormwatch and Union, um, but it had to get delayed due to the very tragic and untimely death of Willis Portacio's sister, uh, Portacio being one of the co-writers and the lead penciler on this book. Uh, I don't believe his sister was very old. I'm pretty certain she was in her 20s. And her death was really kind of unexpected, even though she had been battling illness. And understandably, Willis had was going through a lot emotionally and couldn't, you know, put all of his focus on a monthly title when dealing with such a tragic and sudden loss. Willis Portacio, Plot and Pencils, Brandon Choi, Plot and Dialogue, Scott Williams, Inks, Bill Oakley, Letters, Joe Chiodo, Colors. We can see here that there's an actual foldout on the inside cover, which contains a rather touching letter um, from Willis Portacio paying tribute to his late sister saying how much that she meant to him, and also thanking a lot of the people that he worked with at Wildstorm for being so understanding and patient with him as he dealt with such a difficult loss in his life and giving him the time and space that he needed to process everything that was going on before he came back to work on this book. Uh, on the very first page of the story, we see that we are in the Balkans, as we see this crazy, over-the-top, futuristic 1994 jet fighter transport ship bringing the Special Ops Team 7 into the location of the Transylvanian Peninsula, per se. I'd point out, too, that this is not the original Team 7. Uh, there is a series that follows the original Team 7. I have issues of that. I do plan on doing some videos on that book as well. However, the only member from that team still present on this iteration of the team is Dane, who is the lead CEO of this team. We see here at the bottom Jester talking to Grail as they're just joking around. This, this early part of the book actually kind of reminds me of a lot or it reminds me a lot of the opening sequence from the movie Predator, where you have all of the soldiers just kind of making jokes with each other, you know, even though they're getting ready to go risk their lives in service of their nation. But the mission that they're currently being deployed on, none of them really have any knowledge of exactly why it is. They've just been brought back from a mission less than 24 hours prior to this one and are just automatically being redeployed, which is not common. Uh, Mendoza here says that he has absolutely no idea what's going on. He tried to gain some intel when they were at base preparing to take off and nobody seemed to really know what was going on. And the team as a whole is really kind of in the dark and not certain as to what awaits them on the ground. Here on the next page, we see the conversation continues as Pilgrim interjects, stating that she's kind of surprised at how much explosives they've been given for this mission. Uh, she states that they have enough to level a, an entire city block. Uh, Mendoza asks if Claymore happens to know anything about why they're being deployed, as he seems to be the one who's the most up-to-date on current events. Uh, I, I should point out, this book takes place after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, they are in former Soviet-controlled states, or I should be, are, I should say, are being deployed to former Soviet-controlled states. Uh, there was a lot of turmoil going on at this time in the world, in this part of the world. Uh, there is real concern uh, amongst world leaders, at least in this book, that another large-scale war could break out if anything gets gets real out of hand if 
you know, one of the factions happens to get their hands on a nuclear weapon or a biological agent of some kind and does something to ignite large scale conflict with it. Uh, Mendoza, however, seems to be confident that Colonel Dane will get them through it as we are then introduced to Colonel Dane, who gives them the lowdown on what exactly the mission is. One of the factions in Transylvania has apparently come into possession of said biological agent that, if used, could infect the greater population of Europe and possibly spread across the world, which could result in hundreds of millions of deaths if they do not capture said agent and take out the faction in control of it. Uh, Dane states that this is a very important mission and can literally save hundreds of millions of lives and that they're going to have to bring their A game if they want to make sure that they get out alive and complete the mission to its full objective. Here on the next page, we are transported back to Washington, D.C. in a secure bunker 10 stories underneath I.O. headquarters. I.O. headquarters, of course, being the exact same I.O. headquarters that was mentioned in other Wildstorm books that we've looked at here on the channel, such as Wildcats or Gen 13. If you'd like to know more about Wildcats and Gen 13, please check out my videos and playlists on those video or, or on those titles. We see here an argument going on between two of the high-ranking officials. Uh, we see here that Admiral Haley is concerned about the safety of Team 7 and is wondering why they're being sent in with so little information. He is informed, however, that Team 7 knows what their objectives are and also knows that every single mission they're deployed on could result in one or all of them dying and that this is a very important mission as they show General Haley a video on his screen to let him know exactly what they're dealing with. He then realizes the gravity of what they've been sent to take care of and realizes that they're on a bit of a suicide mission, but they don't know it. Uh, on the next page, we're teleported back to the Balkans, Transylvania, where we see the team do a halo jump from their crazy future transport jet, parachuting onto the ground, quickly dispersing into their roles, uh, splitting up into two-man teams except for Pilgrim, who is on recon. And they're all being observed by this cyborg... Mother One. I love the fact that they went the opposite direction and gave her this super spindly cybernetic arm instead of some crazy huge bulked out thing. Though it does have this gun attachment on the side. Uh, she's actually quite impressed at how precise Team 7 is as she's witnessing and watching. And then in her monologue states that she and her team are there to make sure that no one leaves the facility that they're infiltrating, whether they be friend or foe, as it's very clear that Team 7 is not supposed to make it out of this mission alive. Here on the ground, we're reunited with Team 7 as Pilgrim gives a report to Dane stating that all of the perimeter defense sensors have been completely dismantled. Unfortunately, they were not dismantled by her and that someone else has beaten them to this facility. Uh, we see here that Grail is a little concerned about what they're hearing. Dane also feels like something is not on the up and up. We then see Flattop realizing that the defenses of this facility are really quite impressive and could stop an entire battalion. So while they are happy they're not having to face off against them, they are still worried about what's been done to sabotage all of these defenses as they continue to move into the facility with caution. As they enter the facility, they see that there has been an absolute bloodbath and that someone has really taken it to the people inside of this facility with some incredibly heavy weaponry that even the Team 7 members do not have in their possession. I find it odd that none of them seem to notice that one of these people slash creatures has huge fangs in its mouth. It seems like you might have paid attention. 
They continue to move deeper into the facility and notice that a giant hole has been blown through bedrock, eight solid feet of bedrock, to give them a very clear path to where they're trying to reach in order to capture the biological agent that they've been sent to recover. As they exit the other side of the tunnel, they enter a laboratory filled with giant vats of biological agent and realize that this is not at all what they were supposed to be running into as the biological agent that they were sent for was supposed to be in a small portable canister. Uh, Jester then realizes as he looks at his scanner, I guess, that there are other life forms moving around within the facility that are closing in on their position. Claymore then realizes that he has seen these types of vats slash organisms before, but can't remember where. Uh, Dane tells him it's really not important, that they have a job to do. Um, also, their explosives have been activated remotely, and they don't know why. However, they only have 10 minutes to get out of the facility before all of the charges start to go off. Dane takes off his communicator and tells them from now on they are radio silent as they don't know who to trust anymore. And then Claymore realizes what it is he's looking at as he read an article about this in the most recent issue of Popular Biology, which is, that's kind of funny. I like that. And that this is a synthetic life form that is non-carbon based and that there was a lab working on it, but the people within this laboratory have apparently figured out how to do it. Unfortunately for the team, they are being observed by someone who is up to no good and is slowly watching and waiting for them to get into position from an air vent above before firing a shot from some sort of laser pistol of some kind. Here on the next page, we see that though the shot missed Claymore, it did strike one of the large tubes filled with the biological agent which explodes outward and starts to cover Claymore and then begins to immediately just cover his entire body and go down his throat and into his nose and completely take over his form as this biological agent is actually a symbiote. The rest of the team checks the air vent and realizes that the perpetrator of the shot has long since disappeared. And Claymore, while still moving is not breathing. They're very worried that their friend could be in very real danger, but they realize that if this agent is in fact a symbiote, that it will need Claymore to survive and that he may be able to control it. So they tell him to keep fighting it to breathe, which he eventually does. Dane then realizes that whatever's going on, they need to stop it here and now. He tells everyone to get in position and start to plant the charges Unfortunately for them, they're now surrounded by a lot of hostiles known as the Night Tribe, who are the ones who were in charge of this facility and have come back to reclaim the biological agent that was housed within it. As the members of the Night Tribe open fire on the team, they are then alerted to the fact that the symbiote that has covered Claymore is apparently bulletproof as he's able to block all of the incoming fire as the rest of the team takes cover. However, the members of the Night Tribe were unaware that Dane and Grail were in position to cut them off as soon as they entered the room. They make short work of them, I guess, slitting their throats with these weird short swords that have saw blades on the back end and katana type handles. Oh my God, these don't make sense at all, but it's hilarious that they're there. However, the team realizes then that despite inflicting what should be mortal wounds on the two attackers, the attackers are not dead. Uh, not until Dane completely cuts the heart out of one and then Grail cuts the head off the other do they die. And then they realize that things are starting to get very out of hand as the rest of the Night Tribe 
corners them and starts to open fire on the opening that they came in through. Grail realizes that they've been cut off and that they're going to have to fight their way out, which is going to be very difficult if the rest of the people they're engaging with are as tough and hard to take down as the two they just encountered. We see here that Grail is standing next to the opening to the room as Jester tells him that they are completely surrounded and they're going to have a real hard time fighting their way out of this. However, they don't have any choice as they are cornered. They look at the vent that their attacker was in. However, it's very small and none other than Pilgrim would be able to fit through it and she refuses to leave the rest of the team behind stating that she's going to stand and fight with the rest of them before she'd abandon them and they're also fighting against the clock as the charges that they brought with them are slowly counting down and very nearing the point where they're going to explode they prepare to make their last stand and take as many of the enemies with them as they can however dane states that he has one more trick up his sleeve Claymore, however, realizing his newfound abilities and near invulnerability to bullets, has decided to take the fight to the aggressors as he has moved outward through the opening to the room and is engaging all of the Night Tribe in hand-to-hand -hand combat, close quarters with guns, realizing that this symbiote is like a second skin and feels like an armor that's part of him, and that these more than a match for all of these night tribe members as they're realizing they're gonna have a real hard time taking him down as their bullets have no effect on him and that he is very quickly taking them out one after another then claymore starts to talk to one of the other team members when he realizes that none of the other team members are with him and that they didn't make it out of the room when he hears the explosion go off from the charges However, we see that the team is completely fine as Dane's idea was to blast open all of the other containment units and free the symbiotes so that the rest of the team could become one with those symbiotes to survive the blast. As we see them emerge from the opening to the laboratory, completely covered in symbiotes, weapons drawn, opening fire on the members of the Night Tribe, Claymore's happy to see that they're still alive, they make quick work of the Night Tribe members as they are one of the most highly skilled teams in the U.S. military, and now they also have superpowers. We see them cutting up members, and for as dumb as I thought the uh, sword slash saw blade katana things were that Team 7 is equipped with, it pales in comparison to how ridiculous this dumbass knife that the Night Tribe member carries as we see, the team is just laying waste to all of the Night Tribe members that they're facing off against. And Dane is proud of his team members for sticking together, even though that they know the secondary explosives are all very quickly counting down and about to go off. But none of the team members are going to leave each other behind in this circumstance. Here on the next page, we these then see that the explosion has happened. All the explosives detonate. Bada boom. <laughs> Apparently, Portasio might have grown up on Long Island. I don't know. But we then see that Team 7 emerges rather unscathed as the symbiotes did protect them. However, I would like to give some credit to Portasio for drawing this in a way that makes sense that Despite all of the team members having high levels of durability and near invulnerability to the explosion, they were still wearing regular clothes, which don't, which is why all of the team members are now naked. However, we see that they either no longer have genitals after fusing with the symbiotes or their genitals are just covered by the symbiotes. I don't know exactly. We see that they're, you know, they have no nipples. They have nothing between their legs. Again, this could just be that the symbiotes are covering all of that or that maybe it's gone now. I don't know. It's not really explained. Uh, but the members talk amongst themselves knowing that they've been betrayed and Grail states that he wants to take the fight to some people in Washington who have earned a call from their team and Dane very much agrees with his idea. 
On the next page, we are teleported back to Washington, D.C. as the men in charge of this operation are all witnessing as their cleaner team is being annihilated, but they don't know by who. We see Craven, who was apparently in the command role of the mission, very upset that everything is just completely falling apart. Uh, Dane referenced Craven and also Lynch, who we have seen before in not only Wildcats, but Gen 13, as two of the people that he wanted to have a real chat with. However, in the background, we see two men who have not been featured up until this point talking amongst themselves, none other than Mr. Lupo and what is this guy's name? Weering. Okay, Lupo and Weering are in the back just speaking amongst themselves as they apparently have been working together to aid Team 7 and make sure that they make it out of this mission alive as they don't seem to agree with the direction that Craven was taking them in. However, Craven has commanded the gunships that they had, I mean, look at these ridiculous things. This should be in outer space, man, but apparently this is just normal tech that the U.S. military had at their disposal in 1994. He has commanded the gunships that were part of the cleaner team to take aim and annihilate the entirety of Team 7 as we see them move forward, one of which is being captained by none other than Mother 1. Inside of Gunship Alpha, we see Mother One in the captain's chair as she commands the other members of the crew to give her control of the weapon system as they have taken aim at the entirety of Team 7 along with Gunships uh, Bravo and Delta. However, one of the crew members realizes that she has changed the aiming coordinates to have their weapons aimed at the other two gunships. She then tells him that he is correct, but unfortunately he's not going to live to see anything else as he realizes she also has the symbiote. And it's not explained how she gets her hands on some of the symbiote as well. Unless she was inside of the facility before them and she was the one that disabled all of the perimeter defenses and killed so many of the Night Tribe members that were there prior, which I guess could be the case. I mean, she might be that hardcore. She does have a crazy cyborg gun arm. I don't know. But it's not really explicitly explained that that's what happened. As we see, she then takes aim at the other two gunships, which return fire and destroy the one that she is captaining. However, she also is able to weather explosions in her symbiote as she falls to the ground, also totally naked. Again, it makes sense in context of what she just survived and explains to the rest of Team 7 what exactly happened, that they've all been betrayed by their leaders and that if they want to continue, that they need to team up with her so that she can help them to not only survive, but to potentially get some payback on the people who have betrayed them. We then see outside of the facility much later on, there is smoldering rubble everywhere as a team of Night Tribe soldiers, along with Prince Drakan, who is apparently one of their leaders, is ex total is exploring the facility and trying to evaluate the damage that has been done noticing that how many of their scientists and soldiers have all been killed he's very angry and states that it's time for the night tribe to return to their old ways and to come out of the shadows and take the fight back to the humans uh, one of his soldiers questions whether or not this is a wise idea and states that it will anger the queen However, Drakan states that he's tired of her ineptitude and is ready to take control. The soldiers are then worried that they've angered him and he's going to lose control of himself and basically fall into a blood rage. However, he states that he's been able to maintain control despite starting a transformation and that at this point he's wanting to find whoever did this to the facility and make them pay for it and return the Night Tribe to its prominent place of glory that it once was in. The whole book, it's kind of inferred that the Night Tribe members 
are in fact vampires, though it's never explicitly stated in this book. And we're going to have to wait until another issue to see if they ever really explain all that, because that's the end of the story in this book. On the next page, we get an advertisement for Wetworks number two. Once again, I'm pretty certain that this is a vampire right here. It looks like one, but I don't know. I, I could be wrong, but I doubt that I am. And another advertisement on the next page, this time for Stormwatch. This is a really cool looking black and white image. Like I said in previous videos, I really enjoy Stormwatch a lot. Uh, if you'd like to know more about Stormwatch, check out my Stormwatch playlist. Uh, it's a really fantastic team-up comic and very much my favorite team comic of the early days of Image. As we turn the page once again, we see advertisement for two more Image team-ups as we see an advertisement for Gen 13 number zero. If you would like to know more about Gen 13 number zero, feel free to take a look at my video on Gen 13 number zero. And the next page, we see an advertisement for the Wildcats animated series as we see the team exploding out of the television set. I find it odd here that, for whatever reason, Zealot's costume is pretty much about as revealing as it was in the comic books. However, we see that Voodoo is now covered head to toe in like a Spantex unitard. And... I guess that would make sense if they had done it to both characters, trying to, you know, kind of desexualize them for Saturday morning, which is exactly when this cartoon was airing. Was it, it was a Saturday morning cartoon. But it just seems like a really odd artistic choice to only cover up one of the women and not the other, who is still wearing, you know, a rather skimpy outfit, while the other one is just completely covered. I, I don't know. It, it's really odd. I, I'd, I'd be interested if anybody had an idea as to what the thought process on that was. On the next page, we get a two-page rundown of when the show will be airing at 10 a.m. on CBS on Saturday mornings. September 17th, I guess, is when it's going to, was supposed to premiere. I do find it odd that on this page, they're giving you a rundown of who all of the team members are and their names because at this point Wildcats had already been running in comic book form for like roughly two years and it seems to me that if you're reading this book you've at least peripherally heard of Wildcats at some point in the past and if you hadn't heard of Wildcats you most likely would not have been buying this Wetworks comic that's just my opinion but Again, it just seems odd to waste two pages of book advertising on like, hey, guess who all these characters are? Exactly who you thought they were because you've already read about them for the last two years. Here on the next page, we get to see some early concept art for the show, which is kind of cool, I guess, a little behind the scenes stuff. Um, again, it's kind of given a real rundown about what the show is going to be about. And I could understand if this advertisement was appearing in like a DC or a Marvel title. But again, for it to appear in another Wildstorm book, it's almost a given that if you're buying a Wildstorm title, you've read at least one issue of Wildcats by this point. But hey, I could be wrong. I don't know. And here on the last page of the book, we get a little rundown of the creative team who is responsible for the Wild Wildcats animated series, of course, giving proper, uh, you know, notice about Jim Lee, the creator of Wildcats. Uh, I always forget, too, that Jim Lee was actually born in South Korea and then immigrated to America. I don't know why I, for some reason, thought he was born in Cal California. I mean, I always knew he was Korean. I just didn't realize he was actually a natural-born Korean citizen. Uh, then, you know, more people involved in the television production. Uh, let's see, we've got Hasami Giacumis. God, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. I'm really sorry. David Wise and Bobtown Productions. If you've never watched the Wildcats animated series, you can if you like. Personally, I didn't care for it. Uh, if you really enjoy Wildcats, they had to 
really toned down a lot of it to make it palpable for Saturday morning cartoons. It's not the worst show ever, and it's definitely not the worst superhero show of that era. But, again, it's, you know, it, it really was trying to pick up a and capitalize on a completely different demographic than, I think, who was buying and reading the books. Um, and then here on the reverse inside cover, we see an advertisement for the Lord of the Rings game on Super Nintendo. If you've never played this game, good. It's awful. It's... <laughs> If you really like Lord of the Rings, you're going to hate this game for what it does to Lord of the Rings. And if you don't like Lord of the Rings, you're just going to be completely lost as to what this game is supposed to be about. I I only played it a few times, and to be fair, it's probably been 20 years since I played this game, at least. But from what I remember, it's you have no idea what you're doing or what you're supposed to be doing. The controls are god-awful. The combat system makes no sense. They really did their best to try and capitalize on a very prominent license, but in just the worst way possible. The, the game is awful. Do not waste your time with it. And that was Wetworks number one. Overall, I really enjoy Wetworks. I think it's a really cool title. I enjoyed this book. The only criticism I would have about this first issue is that especially once all of the team members get their symbiotes, it does start to become really difficult to tell one member of the team apart from the other as they're all just big, muscly, gold people. I mean, obviously you have the two female characters, but again, both of the characters have black hair that's long and flowing. So, I mean, one of them does have a cybernetic arm, so that helps. But a lot of the guys on the team... You know, Mendoza, Dane, Claymore, Flattop, they're all these muscle-bound soldier guys with crew cuts. And, you know, when you paint them all the same color, it becomes really difficult to, you know, distinguish one from another as the reader. However, props to Portasio and the rest of the creative team who was working on this book. This is a problem they address in later issues as they start to find ways to make the team members stand out from one another. And in my recollection, because it's been a while since I've read those books, they did a pretty decent job. And they did start to find ways to not make all of the characters kind of feel like the same character, which I believe was the smart move to make in that situation. But then again, those are just my opinions. You may have loved this book, but you might have really hated it. But either way, that's okay. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. Uh, you know, if you enjoyed today's video, please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. And thanks for stopping by. Have a nice day.